Tonight our uh, uh, subject of concern is uh, the crisis in Syria, the Syrian civil war, and what it means uh, for the Middle East. And our guest, as you know, is Ambassador Robert Ford. Uh, interestingly, he's a graduate of Johns Hopkins. He uh, has his master's degree from Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies and is now residing in Baltimore. So he's, he's one of us, and uh, we're absolutely delighted that he's here. Now, he's been uh, a Foreign Service officer, recently retired, after 29 years of uh, honorable service in which he received five, I believe, honor awards from the department, as well as uh, their interesting profile in Courage Award, uh, and of course the latest tour demanded that. Uh, he uh, is one of those remarkable Arabists that the State Department has, uh, knowledgeable of the area. He's been assigned uh, to several of its, its uh, capitals and lesser cities. <laughs> He's been a uh, deputy chief of mission in Bahrain. He served uh, in Iraq for two years at the embassy. And uh, he's been our ambassador to Algeria. And then as we all know, most recently, he's been immersed in Syria, January of 2011 until a few weeks ago. Uh, during that time, he's been a strong supporter. Uh, it would appear from every angle of the opposition to President Assad. Uh, he was a prime mover in getting the uh, rebellious forces to come to Geneva. He was our representative at the two latest Geneva uh, talks. Uh, so he knows the area very well. It's been an important part of his life. Uh, we're extremely fortunate to have him with, him with us this evening. It's my great pleasure to present Ambassador Robert Ford. Um, I spoke at the council here in Baltimore two years ago, and that was the largest group I had ever addressed. And I think, Frank, you have gathered an even larger group tonight. I thought it would be in Washington you'd have the big crowds, but it's here in Baltimore. I think there are even people from Bolton Hill here tonight. I saw one, there's, yeah, there's the other, I saw some others. And um, we met some very nice students, my wife and I, Alice and I just met some very nice students from Cecil County, from West Nottingham. There was even a young lady from Turkey, and Allison and I spent two fabulous years in Turkey at the start of our diplomatic service. Um, Frank, thank you very much for the invitation. It's a delight to be here, and it's a delight to address the uh, Council on Foreign Relations, and I just want to thank you for the work you do um, to bring people to Baltimore and to talk about issues of the hour, the talk on Ukraine sounds excellent. I don't even think I could come close to um, competing with that. But let me talk um, for about, I don't know, 20, 25 minutes about Syria. And I want to say up front, um, I'm going to take you into the bowels of the civil war there. I'm going to get into some detail because I don't think you can understand how hard the policy choices are. Um, the choices that confront the Obama administration and other members of the international community if you don't understand the complexities on the ground. And so I'm not going to shy away from those. Um, if there are questions, then I think there will be plenty of time to take those. So um, I came here to the council two years ago. And uh, at that time, in 2012, uh, the opposition was really getting organized. And to the point that one year ago, one year ago, the Assad regime was losing the war. It had lost control of the Turkish border. It had lost control of most of the city of Aleppo, the largest city in the country. It had lost control of eastern Syria. And the suburbs of Damascus, the capital, were surrounded. And the regime was under attack, even in the capital. The regime had lost control of its energy fields, and energy matters, oil matters in Syria, because that's where they get about 30% of the government's budget revenues. The opposition was really optimistic. I met uh, the opposition leaders in Cairo in February, 
2013, and I said, well, I think I will be back to see you again in a month as we continue to, to push forward on finding a solution. And they said, oh, Robert, we'll see you in Damascus in a month. So what happened? What happened? Well, a number of things happened. First of all, Iran organized people to go fight for the stumbling Assad regime. First and foremost, Lebanese Hezbollah. Lebanese Hezbollah, which dominates Lebanon, sent somewhere around 5,000 fighters, very good fighters, experienced. They had fought the Israelis very well. Uh, they sent them into Syria starting in April 2013. Um, those of you who watched the news today from the Middle East, uh, the Lebanese defense minister today estimated there are 7,000 Hezbollah fighters in Syria right now. Um, the Hezbollah fighters went into a place called El Qusayr up on the Lebanese border, and the Free Syrian Army, the armed opposition, made a bad mistake. They stood at El Qusayr and they fought house to house. And they fought, they stood their ground, and they got pounded. They got pounded by airstrikes, they got pounded by artillery, and they got pounded by tank fire. They don't have, Free Syrian Army doesn't have airplanes, it doesn't have tanks, and it doesn't have artillery. And so they got really thumped hard. They were in full retreat. The Iranians then kept flowing in help. They've been flying airplanes over Iraq, loaded with fighters. They're organizing Iraqi militia now to go and fight in Syria. Many of the same fighters, the American forces were fighting in Iraq in places like Sadr City. Remember Sadr City? Um, in Baghdad. Many of those same Shia fighters are now on the ground fighting in Syria. There are even Afghan Shia and Yemeni Shia who have been sent now to fight for the Assad regime in Damascus. This is important. Why? Because Assad's own base, the population that supports him, is actually pretty small. The Alawi community is only about maybe 10, 12% of the population, and they have taken horrific casualties. The Syrian Observatory for Human Rights estimates that the regime has lost somewhere in the neighborhood of 70,000 fighters. If half of those are Alawis, that would be about 35,000. My guess is it's actually a little higher, maybe 40,000. The Alawi community is about the size of Baltimore. If Baltimore had suffered 40,000 dead, do you think we would be in shock? I think the Alawis are in shock. And the ones that I have met during the past 18 months, most of them have expressed a desire to get out of this mess. But in the meantime, the manpower shortages, the manpower shortages that Assad increasingly has, as his small base suffers casualties, the Iranians are helping. They're sending in manpower. Lebanese Hezbollah, Iraqi Shia, and Shia fighters from other places. And the Russians are helping too. I don't want to leave them out. Um, Professor Bob Friedman is here, and he knows more about Russia than I ever will in the Middle East. But what is clear is the Russians are sending in a lot of assistance in terms of weapons, spare parts, and advisors. Um, and that is important. Remember when I said the Free Syrian Army stood and fought, but then they got pounded by air power. That's the Russian help. So the war, in a sense, turned around for Assad starting just about May 2013. But Assad has not won. The Turks, the Saudis, and the Qataris are sending in now lots of aid, too, to Assad's opposition. And so what you're getting is this group of Sunni states, led by Saudi Arabia and Turkey and Qatar, against Iran and their Assad regime. The rebels still control geographically, if you just look at a map of Syria, the rebels still control about two thirds of the country. They control the east, they control the north, and they control the southern part right along the Jordanian border. And in fact, 
the regime lost control of those border points along Jordan just in the last couple of months. Uh, we don't, there's a little bit of press on it, but you don't see much. There are more arms going in to help the rebels. And if you look at the videos, this war has to have more YouTube videos than any conflict in human history. If you look at the videos, you'll notice there are a lot more advanced anti-tank weapon systems going in. There are lots of foreign jihadis going in too to fight Assad's regime, the Al-Qaeda people and other Islamic extremists. There are a lot of them, maybe 7,000. It's a rough estimate. No one knows exactly. But most, I want to underline this point, most of the people fighting Assad's regime are not Islamist extremists. They may be in Islamist-oriented battalions, but they're not extremists. So where are we now? Where have we come out? The regime, if you've been watching the news, just in the last month, the regime scored some more victories along the Lebanon border, a place called Kalamun. The opposition, just in the last two weeks, counterattacked hard, real hard, right up in the northwest corner of the country, Alawi heartland, took the regime by surprise, overran some villages, and they killed one of Bashar al-Assad's cousin, who was a big militia leader up there. Each side has gains and losses. Neither side, neither side is able to deliver a knockout blow. Neither side is able to deliver a knockout blow. We have a regional war, as I mentioned, Lebanon, Lebanese fighters, Iraqi fighters, Iranian soldiers going in have all died on behalf of the Assad regime. And foreign Sunni fighters from all over the Arab world, from Morocco and Tunisia and Libya, to Yemen, the Emirates, Saudi Arabia, plus Chechens from the Caucasians, Azeris also from that region, and others of the Sunni denomination have fought and died to get rid of Assad. It is a real regional conflict. I got to argue about this once with John McCain in front of the Senate. Um, it's also, with all due respect to Senator McCain, it is also a civil war. As I mentioned, the Alawis in Syria are the base of Assad's support. And as I said, they're not fighting because they love Bashar al-Assad. Many of them don't. They're worried that they're going to get massacred. I go back to the YouTube videos. There are literally dozens of videos of the anti-Assad forces murdering, beheading, and right in front of a camera, beheading Alawi captives or regime prisoners. Uh, they've killed Christians that way too. They've desecrated churches. Not all people fighting Assad have done that. Remember what I said, only a minority of the opposition is extremist, but it's a very visible and it's a very loud, it's a very prominent minority. And so Christians, Alawis, and many secular people in Syria are terrified, really terrified, of what this opposition means and what it brings. And then, I told you it was going to be detailed, just to add one more complication, there is a Kurdish angle. Kurds are not Arabs, they're not Persians, they're their own ethnic group, largely in Turkey, Iran, Iraq, and Syria. Syrian Kurds have now banded together and declared their own autonomous region in the far northeast of the country. So you have, in a sense, a three-way game. Assad regime, opposition to Assad, mostly Sunni Arabs, and Kurds. If you think it can't get much more complicated, now is a good time to get a drink of water. So where is this going? Remember what I said, nobody can deliver a knockout blow. I'm now looking forward. Um, now that I'm retired, I can publicly predict. Um, I think the regime is gonna hold Damascus, and they're gonna hold the road, the I-95, if you will, of Syria, that connects Damascus going straight north to Aleppo. That's roughly the western one-third of the country, one-third, one-fourth. I don't see much chance that the opposition is going to be able to dislodge Assad and his 
allies from that area. Assad, in fact, is very confident now. He doesn't think he's going to be overthrown from that area. And so he's going to run for re-election this summer. It's going to be a farce. No one has ever beaten an Assad in an election in Syria. Uh, no one has even gotten five percentage points of the vote in an election against an Assad. Um, so Assad will win the election, but he won't control the north, he won't control the east, and he won't control the south. And Hezbollah and the other Iranian friends are almost certainly not going to launch their forces hundreds of miles from Damascus to try to go liberate those areas. The north and the south, moreover, are right next to Jordan and Turkey. And that's where the opposition gets its supplies. That's where it gets its arms. And so digging them, digging the opposition out of those areas is going to be really hard, really hard for the regime and its friends. And if you want an example of that, just look at the fighting the last two weeks that I mentioned up in Latakia. So if Assad isn't going to control the north and the south and the east, who is? And does it matter? Well, the answer is it does matter, and it's really frightening. Right now, an Al-Qaeda-connected group called the Islamic State controls many of these areas. Uh, they control an entire provincial capital in the north center of the country. It's called Raqqa. And they're enforcing a very tough Islamic law there, um, complete with beheadings, people's hands getting chopped off for theft, and other atrocities. In other places, like Aleppo, where the opposition holds most of the city, not all of it, it's literally neighborhood by neighborhood. Different militias control different neighborhoods. Um, it's extremely difficult in those circumstances um, to understand who controls what for very long. They fight each other constantly. No single group, in other words, in this whole expanse of Syria, no single group controls any major area. It's kind of almost like a vacuum with different groups coming in and out. And don't forget about the Kurds up in the Northeast that I mentioned. So where we're going to end up as you project forward, say even six months, the regime controls the Western one third, the Kurds have a little strip in the Northeast, and the rest of Syria, very big space, is going to be virtually out of control. No one will control it. Now, why does this matter for us? Well, first of all, there's a basic human decency element. About a third of the Syrian population, more than a third, has been displaced from their homes. Imagine if a third of the American population, roughly a hundred and, say, 110 million people had been displaced from their homes in the United States. That's what's happened in Syria. There are two and a half million refugees in the neighboring countries, Jordan, Turkey. Lebanon now has over a million, which is to say more than one-fourth of the people in Lebanon physically today are Syrian refugees, more than a fourth. Um, and then also in Iraq. There are some in Egypt too, but not so many. Their needs are enormous. And there are another six and a half million people who have lost their homes inside Syria but haven't left the country yet. And this is costing the United States real money. We are now up to $1.7 billion in humanitarian assistance for these Syrian refugees. 1.7 billion and climbing. The figure a year ago was only half that. So projecting forward, we will easily cross over 2 billion, I am sure, within the next few months. And it's not nearly enough, even though we have given more money than any country, and other countries are contributing, European countries, Japan, uh, some of the Arab countries. It's just not nearly enough money. The United Nations had its largest appeal ever for humanitarian assistance at a conference John Kerry attended in January. Uh, and they pleaded for $4 billion globally, just for one year. They're not getting enough, and so the day before yesterday, the United Nations announced it would have to start cutting food rations to refugees. 
So again, project forward. We're already having some political and economic problems in the neighboring countries from these refugees. As we cut their food rations, you can imagine it's not going to get better. We remember the problems that accompanied Palestinian refugees in neighboring countries like Jordan and Lebanon in the 1970s. There is no sign that the hapless Syrian refugees are going to be able to go home anytime soon. The fighting, as I said, is kind of a stalemate. Mm -hmm. Neither side can deliver a knockout blow. And even if, by a miracle, Assad fell tomorrow, and he won't, there is no economy for the people to go home to. The countries, the damage to the country's economy is they've been set back, according to the United Nations, 40 years. And let's be honest, the refugees in the neighboring countries are a lot luckier than the civilians that are trapped inside towns surrounded by regime forces that are being starved day by day by the regime. Should mention here, the regime, because it doesn't have enough soldiers, it usually will not attack into a town where there's heavy opposition presence. So they just surround it and starve it. They will allow no food in, and they will allow no people out. Um, this is a violation of the Geneva Convention. Even the Russians agree with that. Um, we estimate there are about 175 to 200,000 Syrian civilians, civilians trapped in these towns right now. Um, there was a United Nations Security Council resolution passed in February demanding the regime allow access. No result. Nothing. That's the situation in Syria. It's pretty grim. Now, it's not happening by itself in a vacuum. And so I did in this talk want to talk a little bit about the broader Middle East and what's happening. So I mentioned that Iraqi Shia are going in and fighting for Assad. And there are Iraqi Sunnis especially going in to fight with Al-Qaeda. I was just in Iraq. I came back a week ago today. Uh, and what I heard was pretty discouraging. The Al-Qaeda presence in Iraq, the presence that our soldiers fought so hard to contain and reduce, is growing again, growing throughout the western part of the country. And you read reports in the Baltimore Sun, the New York Times, hear it on NPR, of car bombs set off by these terrorists. And those car bombs are going up very rapidly. The Sunnis that allied with David Petraeus in 2007 to fight Al-Qaeda have disbanded. They are not there anymore. And so the Al-Qaeda problem is really on the rise in Iraq. And on top of that problem, Iraq too has Kurds. And the Kurdish leaders I met last week were very clear that they are getting increasingly angry with the government in Baghdad over the division of oil revenues. And they are thinking of uh, the expression of the Kurdish region president was reforming the Iraqi state. What he really means is moving towards independence. So that's Iraq, very troubled. The movement of people back and forth between Western Iraq and Eastern Syria makes the job of fighting Al-Qaeda even harder. It's the same Al-Qaeda group. It just moves back and forth across the sandy deserts. There's no border fence. And meanwhile, in Lebanon, small Lebanon, I mentioned a fourth of the population there now are refugees from Syria. There is growing tension between the Lebanese Hezbollah Shia community and the Sunnis in Lebanon. So there have been car bombs again in Beirut, which we had mercifully uh, not seen for really decades. Uh, there's been heavy fighting in the north of Lebanon, close to the Syrian border, between Sunni extremists, many of them coming out of Syria, and uh, allies of the Assad regime. I had lunch last Thursday with a very prominent Lebanese journalist, very experienced, 30 years in the business, covering politics in the Middle East. He was extremely downbeat about Lebanon's prospects. And so what I see are a variety of analysts, including this Lebanese journalist, but even people like Robin Wright, 
uh, from the Los Angeles Times and the Wilson Center in Washington, and Lieutenant Colonel Joel Rayburn, who worked with us in David Petraeus in Iraq. He's now at the National Army College. They're all saying the same thing. Lebanon, Syria, and Iraq are at great risk of complete state meltdown. And a complete state meltdown marked by Al-Qaeda and sectarian and ethnic tensions all wrapped up into one evil little mess. So what does that mean for us? Thank God we've got the Atlantic Ocean between us and them. Well, I mentioned already the humanitarian costs, and they're going to grow. Moreover, in these ungoverned spaces, as states melt, ungoverned spaces increase, Al-Qaeda and terrorist elements will have plenty of room to plan. That's what they did in Afghanistan before 9-11. So it's not surprising that the Secretary of Homeland Security, Jay Johnson, last month, I'm sorry, in February, said that the Syrian crisis is now a major problem for American homeland security. Why? He is concerned that people that go over there to fight will come here to implement terrorist attacks using the skills they acquired in the Syrian conflict. And in January, Director of National Intelligence Jim Clapper said that Al-Qaeda-linked cells now in Syria are already training and planning to hit targets in Western countries. The British have already wrapped up one cell that came home from Syria back to Britain and was plotting an attack in the United Kingdom. Thank God they wrapped them up. And other allies like France and Belgium are in a full state of alert now. So we have an immediate problem in this ungoverned area in Syria. So what are we to do? We have a problem. What are we to do? Well, I took you into the bowels of the war, or a bit of it, just to say it's a really complex problem. And an American senator last month, looking at all of this, an American senator in a media interview regretted that there are no good choices. Well, I'm here to say I would respectfully disagree. There are no easy choices. There are no simple choices, but there are choices that are better than other choices. Doing nothing means that that crisis, that arc of crisis from Lebanon to Iraq is going to get worse. Doing something, doing something, or doing more than we are doing, does not mean we have to go to war in Syria. I want to emphasize this point. This is something Marty Dempsey, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, sometimes implies. And I think we have to be real clear about this. Doing more in Syria and in Iraq does not mean going back to war in Iraq or going to war in Syria. It is not an automatic slippery slope. And besides, doing nothing more has its own costs in terms of the risks to our national security. And I'm not even talking about the suffering of the innocent civilians. So let me leave with five thoughts on guidelines that ought to govern our policy going forward. First, let's recognize that the Syrian conflict is going to be a long fight. It's a civil war. It's a regional war. It's full of sectarian hatred. It's going to go on for many months, if not years. That's the first thing to understand. No quick fix. Second, the long conflict means there are going to be more refugees. There's going to be more pressure on the countries that take in the refugees. And we are going to have to sustain and even increase our humanitarian aid. We're going to have to lead in that effort so that other countries also contribute. If we don't lead, other countries won't contribute. And they look to us for leadership. You may not like to be the leaders on this. It costs money. But it's the reality. And if we don't do it, we will be watching kids starve on television. But humanitarian aid is not going to fix the Syrian problem. 
So what else should we do? It's not easy, as I said. We're going to have to prioritize goals. And we're going to have to get friends to help us with our priorities. That's what international politics is all about, getting friends to help you do what you need to do. President Obama has made clear that our top interest in Syria is to stop the terror threats against our homeland. And in the context of the Syrian crisis, that means making sure that Al-Qaeda does not develop a foothold in those empty, ungoverned spaces in that two-thirds or three-quarters of the country that Assad will never regain control of. So that's the third guideline, confront Al-Qaeda. Now on the Iraq side of the border, we have actually stepped up our assistance to the Iraqi government. We're sending in missiles and other equipment. That makes sense. They're the ones they're fighting. The Iraqi forces are fighting Al-Qaeda. That makes sense, doesn't it? Well, go west 100 miles over the desert. Remember, there's no border fence. There are people fighting Al-Qaeda now in eastern Syria, in northern Syria, in southern Syria. And it's not, it's not the Assad regime. It's the armed opposition, moderate elements in the armed opposition. In fact, I think I really want to emphasize this point here too. I have heard some people in the United States say, well, Assad's the one that's going to help us with Al-Qaeda. I am really sorry. Assad organized Al-Qaeda to send forces to kill our soldiers in Iraq. Al-Qaeda car bombers in Iraq came from Syria with Syrian help. The same Bashar al-Assad that's there today. Moreover, Assad now is a magnet drawing in these jihadis. As long as he's there, the magnet will pull them in. He is not the solution to the terrorism problem. Instead, helping moderate forces in the armed opposition is going to be our best bet. We need to get the material and money to fight, contain, and even pull away some of the Al-Qaeda fighters. So, should we just do it? Should we just do it? No. I think we have to be pretty shrewd and tough about it. If we're going to help them, we want something in return. We give nothing for free. Of course we want them to fight Al-Qaeda. But there's another thing we want, and this is my fourth guideline for going forward. We still need to get back someday to a political negotiation in Syria. And I don't want to be naive about this. I spent a good part of my last 12 months setting up the Geneva Peace Conference that failed almost immediately. It went nowhere. The Assad regime was completely unwilling to discuss any kind of a transition government. And the Russians did nothing to help. And to be honest with you, academic studies of civil wars around the world generally conclude it's really hard to get a negotiated settlement to a civil war. One side or the other side usually wins. So we may not get to any real negotiation anytime soon, but I think it's still where we want to aim in the long term, even if it takes years to get back to that negotiation. And we will want an armed opposition that we have helped and we have strengthened a moderate armed opposition to move in the direction of a political negotiation when we can get there. And so here's my fifth and final guideline. Don't let the opposition that you're helping undermine a peace deal. What do I mean by that? They're gonna, we're going to give them help. I would suggest, that they're going to use against Al-Qaeda, but we know they're also going to use it against Assad. I'm actually all in favor of that. If there isn't more pressure on Assad, he's never going to negotiate anyway. Um, but the opposition has to open the way to eventually move towards a political deal. There are things that they can do to make that political deal more possible. The first thing is they need to distinguish their agenda from the Al-Qaeda agenda. And they have done a miserable job of doing that, a miserable job. 
when the people in Damascus think about the opposition, they still think of Al-Qaeda. And that is because the moderates have done such a bad job explaining their own position. So how do they distinguish themselves? Here are some examples. When their people commit crimes, punish them. Not one single person in the armed opposition, moderate or Al-Qaeda, has ever been punished for killing civilians. Not once. That has to change. If we're going to help them, that has to change. They could exchange prisoners. They hold hundreds of Alawi prisoners. They've even kidnapped civilians. They need to be released. It's just a gesture of goodwill to open the space for a political negotiation. They could offer, in addition, uh, to allow uh, family visits and movement into some of the, op uh, the Alawi areas that are surrounded by the opposition. And finally, and perhaps most important, they need to set out a vision for the next government. I talked in, in Geneva, I said transition government. We, the Americans, John Kerry, President Obama, have talked for a long time about a transition government. What we mean by that is that Assad goes and there is some other kind of temporary government until we can get to elections. The United States still thinks Assad has to go, and I certainly think he has to go. But in a negotiation, you don't win everything. And the opposition will have to recognize that some nasty people, some nasty people, are probably going to stay in a transition government. It's the only way to assure the supporters of Assad that they're not all going to be massacred, that they're still going to have friends in the government that can protect them. The good news in this is that the opposition in Geneva in February did put forward an initial proposal for a transition government. They actually tabled a paper. Um, and the UN looked at it, and they liked it. They praised it. Um, you can find it on the internet, for those of you that really want to study in on this. Go to the Opposition Coalition website, and you'll find it. What's really interesting about that paper is it didn't even say Assad has to go. It was very clever. They were trying to lure the regime into negotiating a transition, but the regime didn't take the bait. They just plain out said we're not going to discuss it. And so the opposition needs to keep pushing that, even if there isn't a Geneva conference, and you need to keep pushing the idea of a transition government with some people from the existing government in it to protect the regime's supporters but to allow a political process to go forward. Before we give help to the armed opposition, we need to insist on that. In conclusion, recognize that the Syrian crisis is a long conflict. We're going to have to keep helping meet humanitarian needs. We've got to find friends on the ground in Syria to join the fight against al-Qaeda extremists, just as Petraeus did in Iraq. And we want them to use our aid also to put more pressure on the regime to get back to a negotiation. But those friends in the opposition that we help have to avoid, they have to renounce sectarianism and not just make an occasional pious pronouncement. They're going to have to reach out. We need, in other words, to use our aid to address our American security concerns about al-Qaeda, and about a regional settlement, and also use our aid to put pressure on the regime and leverage with the opposition to get to a serious negotiation to finally end this conflict. I'm going to stop there. Thank you very much. That was, that was probably more than we bargained for. Um, <laughs> There's going to be a test, those who uh, want to get out detail tonight. And answers. And uh, the latter is often uh, uh, absent from presentations. Anyway, the floor is open for questions. There's a microphone in the rear, uh, in the middle aisle on the left and on my right. And if a question does come from the floor, I'm going to have to repeat the question. We've, we've come to look at the Middle East as a unified Arab world versus an Israel 
and, and, and it, it, what they see as fair treatment of the Palestinians. Recent events, though, seem to show the internal Arab Muslim world, there's an a, a internal conflict, the Shias and the Sunnis. And as you described, generally that's Iran, Iraq, uh, Hezbollah, Palestinians versus Saudis, Turks, the Gulf states. Uh, my question is, does this Syrian conflict and this, this formation of opposites replace the uh, Arab uh, uh, concentration on Israel? Or will, after this gets settled, if it ever does, will they unify again to be against Israel? And finally, what side of the Sunni-Shia divide does Al-Qaeda fall on? Sorry. Yeah. yeah. No, 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 that's fine. So um, the last question is easiest. Al-Qaeda is a vehement Sunni extremist group. I mean, they're like the blackest of the black on the Sunni side. Um, did you notice I talked for half an hour, even a little more, on Syria, and I didn't even say the word Israel. They're just not in this at all. And I have to tell you that um, in all of my conversations with Syrians, dating back to when I was at the American Embassy in 2011 and 12, uh, Israel almost never came up once the fighting started between the regime and the opposition. Um, except that more than a few people in the opposition used to say, boy, I wish the Israelis would come in and bomb Assad. Um, no, 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 I'm serious. I'm really serious. I'm not kidding. Um, you, you then asked, will the Arab world go back to focusing on Israel? I think, first of all, the divides now in countries like Syria and Iraq and Libya and Lebanon are so deep that it's going to be a long time before they sort of focus on the outside again. When I worked in Algeria, um, they had just recovered from a civil war. They just were not interested in Israel. They were interested in rebuilding. There's going to be a lot of rebuilding in all of these countries that has to be done. So. Um, it's not to say that Israel will face no security challenges from the neighborhood, but I think it will face many fewer security challenges from the neighborhood. And do you notice that on the Syria conflict, the Israelis actually say very little publicly? Um, a, and when I talked to them, I went a couple of times to Israel just to consult them, give, get advice from them. They usually said, you know, whatever comes up in Syria, we can handle it. We can take care of ourselves. I wondered if you could comment on the composition of the rebel groups prior to being bolstered by Saudi Arabia and other the big countries. Um, I didn't really see this as a religious battle, so I wondered if you saw you know, more of a heterogeneous group, are they going to eventually develop into a more of a secular movement, especially if, we, if you encourage us you know, supporting them and helping them? Um. When this started out in uh, 2011, started in February and March 2011, um, it had very little secular tint at all. Uh, it was really just about Syrian civilians um, from all communities um, doing peaceful marches through cities um, in tens and hundreds of thousands. I mean, I went out and saw them on several occasions usually got attacked by the police when I did it. Um, but they were very peaceful, and uh, they were just demanding, for want of a better word, I would call it dignity, which meant um, no more abuse by the police, no more torture in the police stations, um, fair trials for people that are ever arrested, no more demands, petty corruption, if you want to get a license for this, that, or the other thing, you got to pay a bribe. Uh, just real simple things. They weren't even asking initially for Assad to step down. That only came when the Assad forces kept killing and torturing, arresting people. Um, initially, it was not, as I said, it wasn't religious. It didn't have a heavy Islamist tone. The leaders of the 
these uh, local marches in these different cities. A lot of them were from mosques, but that's because they could use mosques to organize it. Anywhere else, the secret police would come in and arrest everybody. Um, but it has, over the last three years, it has taken on a much more uh, religious tone. All of the fighting units now, most, not all of them, but four-fifths of them, say, have um, Islamic names from Islamic history and things like that. So, um, Would you say just yes or no? Uh, was it a mistake to not uh, um, get involved militarily when we set the red lines to uh, the Syrian regime uh, with regard to using of, um, uh, the use of chemical weapons? And uh, would you say that democracy in the Middle East is in the, in in the interest of the United States in the short and mid-term. The longer questions, I'd say, um, why are we not taking more refugees from Syria, um, having seen the gruesome murder and um, massacres there? And why are, not, are we not addressing the fact that Saudi Arabia is the number one source of extremists and terrorists? Thank you. Um, with respect to the chemical weapons, um, we got what we wanted, which was uh, the uh, plan, an approved plan to destroy them. I mean, even when I was getting ready um, in front of the American Senate to go out as ambassador before this ever started, back in 2010, I was briefed quite a bit on the Syrian chemical weapons program by the CIA and others, and it was always our objective, American government objective, to get those chemical weapons out of Syria. And so even without a military strike, uh, we have a plan in place. And that is being implemented, some delays, but, but it's moving forward. Um, with respect to democracy, my personal view, and I think Secretary Kerry shares this, is that democracy absolutely is in our interest. Um, societies that are democratic generally don't export their problems to their neighbors. Um, with respect, uh, to your question about Saudi Arabia. Um, the Saudis actually are more and more concerned about extremists coming out of Saudi Arabia, and they just passed some laws in Saudi Arabia outlawing, outlawing uh, Saudi citizens from going and fighting in jihads in foreign countries. It's the first time. This was the subject actually between Obama and uh, the Saudi King Abdullah when Obama went to Saudi Arabia a couple weeks ago. If, if you were to look within the uh, Al-Qaeda within Syria, you're saying that this could be a new training ground. What do you think their motivation is, or what would you characterize in your understanding, their major motivations for training and then coming over here to have attacks? Um, there's a really interesting um, news report on the internet that I saw yesterday. Um, a uh, Western reporter, I don't know if he was British or American, he had an Anglo-Saxon name, um, was with uh, one of the members of this moderate armed opposition that I was talking about. And this guy has been fighting Al-Qaeda up in the north along the Turkish border, this uh, armed fighter that he was with. And the armed fighter knew the Al-Qaeda commander's phone number in the area. And his troops had been fighting these Al-Qaeda troops and skirmishes, and they were sort of like you know, two commanders dueling. And he called him, and um, it was quite interesting, and he allowed the reporter to take notes as um, he talked to him with speakerphone. Um, and so this guy, his name was, um, the Al-Qaeda guy's name was Abu Zayman. And he bitterly denounced the United States and said, you know, we're trying to set up a caliphate uh, to return to the glories of the Middle Ages, and the West and the Americans are using you to, uh, to stop the return to Muslim glory. And I think that really says it in a nutshell that they, Al-Qaeda, perceives the United States as the number one blockage to an Al-Qaeda eff uh, effort to reestablish a single Islamic Sharia governed state that goes from Morocco all the way to India. They view us as the number one blockage and so if they can hit us at home and uh, dislodge us, uh, make us uh, accept that caliphate, I think that's what they're trying to do. It's pretty crazy, but that's what they're trying to do. I uh, asked you a question the last time you were uh, speaking here, 
which had to do with unemployment in Syria, and I see now that's a moot point. Uh, I'm embarrassed now that I even asked it. But my question is this. I've, I've studied some of the history of the region and the Sykes-Picot Treaty and World War I, the breakup of the Turkish uh, Empire, you saw Lawrence of Arabia. Uh, why aren't we demanding that the Europeans who have so much more knowledge of the area take a bigger role? I mean, they were the real experts. They're the ones that created so many of the places, the countries that are now in conflict. They should be the ones running it, not us. Yeah. Um, I remember your question on unemployment. You're uh, ki you, no, come on. You, you, you don't have that good. A, I mean, it wasn't that good a question. <laughs> so, well, I went back to my team at the State Department the next day and said, what is the unemployment rate? Oh. So, none of them knew either. Um, Maybe they'll give me a job. Yeah, right, we, could, we can use all the help we can get. Um, <laughs> so here's what I would say um, on the Europeans. They started it. Well, they drew the lines. Yeah, they drew the lines. Didn't all right. do a very good job and split tribes and yeah, families. Yeah, well, we're finding that um, out. And so that's a problem. But realistically, I mean, I've been in a lot of negotiations with the Europeans over the last three years. Um, you may have noticed John Kerry regularly meets with 10 foreign ministers of um, various European and Middle Eastern countries to plot strategy on on Syria, and we do that very consciously to try to keep a consensus on the way forward, which is very difficult. It's kind of a minimal consensus. I don't think the Europeans are going to do anything without us helping them. Uh, they're very, they're hyper cautious. Their resources are much, much more limited. Uh, and so they look, it, it's just a reality. People look to the United States for leadership. The, First, any big conference I've ever been in, the first country that gets called on, what's your opinion? It's the Americans. Um, oh people just God. like to know what we think. We have, I, I, in all modesty, we have superb representatives overseas um, who are always very well briefed and up to speed. And um, people just look to the Americans to hear what we have to think. So the Europeans do need to do more. And they I mentioned the humanitarian, well, they in, in particular do. on the humanitarian assistance. Um, and some European countries have been very generous, such as the British. Um, but we're going to need a lot of help from a lot of countries to help these refugees and internally displaced people. It is a major problem that the UN had to cut food rations to people. There seems to be a pattern, at least there was in Iraq, where sectarian divisions that were um, became exacerbated with political unrest. And the same thing, we've seen the same thing in Syria. Now, at the end of Iraq was that Christians and Christians continue to be persecuted mercil mercilessly by both sides of that, the um, divisions, all sides of the divisions, I should say. So that has an effect on the delivery of humanitarian aid because Christians have been traditionally in that area one of the largest vehicles for distribution of humanitarian aid. So uh, what impact does the um, division, does the sectarian division have upon that delivery? Second is in, in negotiations now, uh, has the State Department, have other world leaders learned anything about um, working with directly with religious leaders to um, work with their people to bring tensions down and I know that Jordan has established a model that is has maintained a balance uh, despite the fact that they are surrounded and flooded with refugees so um, anyway so on the uh, on first of all uh, really bad news for the uh, Christian communities in Iraq They've been targeted mercilessly by Al-Qaeda extremists. Um, and so many of them have fled Iraq. In fact, in Bolton Hill, um, our next door neighbor is an Iraqi Christian refugee um, who fled to this country for his safety. Um, it's kind of funny to be living next to an Iraqi in Bolton Hill. Um, so, but he's, he's a nice young kid. He's making documentary films for Micah. So, um, the same fate awaits Christians in Syria, and they know it. If Al-Qaeda wins and, and 
ultimately governs large chunks of the of the country there, which in my mind would be catastrophic. So um, it's very important that Al Qaeda not be able to do that, which is why I think it's important to confront them in Syria. Um, it does have an impact on the delivery of humanitarian assistance, but not in the way you think. Uh, the sectarian conflict has made it really hard for aid agencies to get aid into communities where there's fighting. Um, the Red Cross told us in January that to get food from Damascus up to the second largest city, Aleppo, they had to go through 53 checkpoints. Um, and the amount of time and negotiating and, you know, no, you can't have those five boxes in that truck, that kind of thing. Um, Christians suffer along with others in terms of the difficulty of getting the aid through. Um, Christian relief organizations have been able um, to send in some supplies from neighboring countries, but they have the same problems that the Red Cross and other delivery agencies have. Most, most, most of the problems in the delivery of aid, checkpoints that won't let the trucks go through, the great majority of the problems are because of the Syrian government. I would estimate conservatively 80 to 90 percent. So it drives me crazy when people equate the two, the opposition and the government in terms of blocking humanitarian aid. The scale is completely different. I wanted to know, what do you think would happen if all of the guidelines were not followed? Um, in addition, if they were not followed, would new ones be formulated to take their place? Well, I think if we don't confront Al-Qaeda, um, we're going to face a really serious terrorist problem. So I hope that third guideline is followed. I've already talked a lot about the humanitarian, which was the second guideline. I'm going to talk about that again. And so the, the fourth and the fifth is really what we do with the opposition. And um, if we just give them help without conditions, uh, they will take it, they'll keep fighting, and they'll never agree to negotiate in the next five years. They'll just fight and fight and fight. Eventually they'll get tired and they'll negotiate. But I'd like to speed up the process of getting to a negotiation, which is why I think every time they ask us for stuff, we have to ask for something back. I mean, we, in the Middle East, it's understood that when you provide something, there will be a price. And so I think we have to have a price. That's the price I would suggest. And I think those down in Washington who do not attach a price are actually encouraging the hardliners in the opposition. And that's not what we need to do.